In this video, we're going to look at acids and bases. So you should have seen a demonstration in class that showed you a little bit about hydrochloric acid. And so you saw that it was a covalent compound because it's made of all nonmetals. And typically, uh, covalent compounds are not uh, good conductors of electricity in water. It's not a good electrolyte. And when we put it on the light bulb, it lit up. And so we know that ions had to be present in the solution in order for that to happen. So even though hydrochloric acid is not an ionic compound, it's in that small subset of covalent compounds. And when we did the types of bonding lab, you saw this when we did the aspirin. The aspirin was a weak conductor of electricity. And that is, uh, remember that the chemical name for aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid. And so what happens with compounds like this is they make ions in the solution. So think about HCl, the ion that you probably recognize from there is chloride. So the other ion must be the H ion. So what happens when we put HCl in water is it, the hydrogen splits off from the HCl and it immediately joins with the water molecule to form something called hydronium or H3O plus and then it leaves you chloride ions. You haven't seen that H3O plus before, but what happens is it when an H plus ion forms, it does not like to hang around. It likes to jump onto a water molecule and stick to it and form that hydronium ion. Think about, you've seen ammonium before. It's ammonia with an extra hydrogen and a positive charge. Hydronium is the same thing. It is a water molecule uh, with a plus charge and we call it hydronium. That IUM suffix tells you that that's a, got that plus charge. And so anything that has makes hydronium ions in water is what we call an acid and those are generally electrolytes because they form those ions in solution. So when we have hydrochloric acid, we have that H3O plus, that's called the hydronium ion. And like I said, that's what we, how we define an acid. So let's talk a little bit more about hydronium because that's really new for you. Depending on how you look at it, Acids make either H+, which are hydrogen ions, but they don't really exist in water. They're not very stable. They're very small and positively charged, and so they're very attracted to water molecules, which means that they form those hydronium ions. So you can kind of think of those as being interchangeable. So if you have H+, and water, it makes hydronium. So anytime you see one, it can mean the other. So H+, can be H3O+, and H3O plus can be H plus. So let's look at some common acids. Some of these you may be familiar with, either in chem lab or just through things that you've done at home or at work. Um, hydrochloric acid we've used in several labs, and uh, mur muriatic acid is something that people use to clean concrete or pools. So if you've ever worked as a lifeguard or worked at a pool or something like that, you might be familiar, familiar with muriatic acid. Uh, sulfuric acid is another one that you may have heard of, and that is what's known as battery acid. We use that in car batteries and things like that. There's uh, nitric acid, HNO3, and that's the acid that I used to dissolve the penny at the beginning of the year. If you remember that demonstration where we started off with the really old dirty penny and it came out really thin and shiny and, and flat, that was the nitric acid. Another one is acetic acid. I'm sure that all of you are very familiar with this, whether you realize it or not. Uh, that's vinegar. So if you like salad dressing and things like that, it has vinegar. And acetic acid is just a weak solution of that. There's also phosphoric acid. This is also something you're probably familiar with. Uh, it's in a lot of sodas, colas particularly. It's added for taste and uh, helps keep it, uh, keep it fizzy and so good stuff. Now, I will expect you to know all of the names and the formulas for those five acids on the left side of your screen. Now, if you look at those formulas, hopefully you are not panicking because you are seeing that 
all of the ones on the bottom, all four of the ones on the bottom, are neutral compounds made from polyatomic ions that you are familiar with. So sulfuric acid is sulfate, and it's sulfate normally has a two minus charge, so you add two hydrogens to that to make it hydro, uh, sorry, sulfuric acid. Nitric acid is nitrate, and nitrate has a negative one charge, so one hydrogen with that to make it a neutral compound. Acetic acid comes from acetate, Phosphoric acid comes from phosphate, so they're all from those polyatomic ions that end in A-T-E. Hydrochloric acid, you will just need to know, and fortunately that one's pretty easy. It's just hydrogen and chloride, so that makes it pretty straightforward. Here are a few others you may be familiar with. I will not expect you to know the formulas for these. Citric acid, that's in a lot of citrus fruits, things like lemons, limes, oranges. Um, lactic acid, if you're an athlete you might be particularly familiar or if you're into biology, that's the acid that builds up in your muscles when you exercise and makes you sore. There's ascorbic acid, you probably had some of this, it's in vitamin C. And then acetyl salicylic acid, you'll remember that, that's aspirin. And then there's steric acid, um, that's like a waxy kind of a substance, kind of like the paraffin wax. So here are some common bases. The nice thing about the bases, you will need to know the, the names and formulas for these, but these all follow our nomenclature rules, so you won't have to worry too much about, you don't have to really learn anything new, just recognize these. So sodium hydroxide is one. Um, you may have heard of things like lye soap, if you ever read maybe the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, or if you had a, a grandmother that used lye soap. Uh, lye is also known as sodium hydroxide or caustic soda. There's another one called calcium hydroxide. When you talk about lime, lime is something, not lime the fruit, but lime is something that you can put on your soil to change the acidity of your soil. It's also what we use to make lime water. And uh, so it's used for a lot of different things. You remember the lime water test from the reactions lab? Um, there's magnesium hydroxide, that's in milk of magnesia, it's an antacid product that you can buy. Your grandma probably took it. Uh, we, when I was a kid it was kind of a big thing, I think less common now. Things like Tums are more popular. But uh, there are some others like ammonia, which is a cleaning product. It's great if you ever have to clean out your oven. Uh, sodium hypochlorite, you might recognize this. This is something that's found in bleach, so Clorox, the name of Clorox, comes from that sodium hypochlorite. And then there's sodium hydrogen carbonate. You're all familiar with this if you liked baked goods because that has, is the formula for baking soda. And then there's calcium carbonate, which is also uh, the substance that's in chalk and Tums, which would explain why Tums taste kind of like chalk. So again, these are things that all follow our traditional nomenclature rules, and so you don't really have to learn anything new, but we, you will need to, to just be familiar with those bases. Now, there are some definitions of bases and acids that we need to talk about, and there are two sets, and so we need to talk about how to recognize which is which. There's what's called an Arrhenius definition of acids and bases, that's the oldest, and it is actually not terribly useful to us. Uh, and we'll go through it, and I want to explain why we talk about it. It's uh, a substance that dissociates. Remember that associate is, like if you have an association, it's a group of people that come together. So dissociates means something that splits and produces hydronium ion in water. So like hydrochloric acid would be an example of that. And there's an Arrhenius base, which is something that dissociates and produces hydroxide ions in water. So something like sodium hydroxide. There are lots of common bases that you would recognize as Arrhenius bases. And then there are some newer definitions that we will use more frequently. This, these are called Brunstad-Lowry definitions. And they're just more useful because when we talk about a Brunstad-Lowry acid, that's a substance that donates a hydrogen ion. Now think about that. I've got the, the term a proton there in parentheses. If you have a hydrogen ion, a hydrogen atom that has lost an electron, 
What's left there is just a proton. So that's why we call a Brunsted-Lowry acid something that donates a proton. And then a Brunsted-Lowry base would be the substance that accepts that hydrogen ion or the proton. And so that's, uh, they're, they're really kind of different, but they're more useful than you might think. So let's look at how we, these overlap. Um, if you look at this example, hydrochloric acid in water, it forms chloride ions and hydronium ions. So that's an Arrhenius acid. And it also donates a hydrogen to water. If you look and you see on the screen, H has left HCl and jumped onto that water molecule to form hydronium. So it has donated an H plus to water. So it's both uh, an Arrhenius acid and a Brunsted-Lowry acid. So all Arrhenius acids are Brunsted-Lowry acids and vice versa. There's really no difference in these two. It's just a different way to look at things. The difference comes when we look at the bases, okay? So it's not quite as simple. If you look at sodium hydroxide, it dissociates or dissolves in water to form sodium ions and hydroxide ions. So we say that it's an Arrhenius base because it forms hydroxide ions. And if you look at this, when we put uh, sodium hydroxide with an acid, it forms, it uh, accepts that hydrogen and it, uh, it makes it a Brunsted-Lowry base. So hydroxide bases are both Brunsted-Lowry and Arrhenius bases because they form hydroxide ions and they also accept a hydrogen ion. So hydroxide bases are both Arrhenius and Brunsted-Lowry bases. But if you look at some non-hydroxide bases, they can't be Arrhenius bases. The definition of an Arrhenius base is that they produce hydroxide, so obviously that can't happen. But they will be Brunsted-Lowry bases. If you look at these examples like a carbonate ion, some kind of a carbonate, and it reacts with a, a hydrogen ion, it accepts that hydrogen ion to form hydrogen carbonate. And if you look at this example, ammonia accepts a hydrogen ion or a proton to form ammonium. So it's kind of like squares and rectangles. All squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. So all bases are Brunsted-Lowry bases, but not all bases are Arrhenius bases. Only hydroxide bases are. The other thing that makes it kind of a pain is that Arrhenius acids and bases are tied to water. So it's, that's really limited. We know that acids and bases can be in other solvents besides water. So Brunsted-Lowry definition doesn't tie that to water. They can be used to describe reactions that take place in the gas phase or in other solvents besides water. So remember the Brunsted-Lowry definitions. A Brunsted-Lowry acid donates a hydrogen ion. A Brunsted-Lowry base accepts a hydrogen ion. So let's finish up with our definitions. Okay, so a monoprotic acid, the mono means one. That's an acid that has one ionizable hydrogen. Monoprotic means one proton. That there's one hydrogen that can form an ion. So things like HCl and HNO3, that one hydrogen will form a hydrogen ion. Diprotic, hopefully you recognize that that di means two, so that would be an acid with two ionizable hydrogens. An example of that would be sulfuric acid, which has two hydrogens there. Then a triprotic acid would be one that has three ionizable hydrogens, and an example of that is phosphoric acid. Now let me give you an example of another one. Think about what kind of an acid acetic acid would be. It may surprise you that this is monoprotic. Remember that, that is, the definition is the number of ionizable hydrogens. And when we look at that, only the hydrogens in front of the, of the formula are ionizable. Remember that we've talked about the fact that the way a formula is written tells you about its, uh, the way that it's shaped and what, how everything is hooked together. That hydrogen out front is able to ionize and separate. That uh, acetate ion 
has all those carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens covalently bonded, it is difficult to separate those. And so typically only the hydrogens that are written at the beginning of the formula are ionizable. They're the only ones that are likely to come off. And that's how we recognize the formula for an acid. It will start off with a hydrogen ion. So here's the cartoon for you. Remind me and we'll talk about it in class if you don't understand it. All right, so let's talk about the autolysis of water. I'm sure that you recognize that the auto prefix means self, and the lysis part of that word comes from the same base as the word lysosome. So when you think of uh, biology, lysosomes tend to break things down. So what happens with autolysis is water spontaneously splits itself, and it splits itself into hydronium and hydroxide ions. So two water molecules, one transfers a hydrogen ion to another water molecule. And that's an equilibrium system. So that suggests that in water, that it should conduct electricity. There are ions, but water doesn't conduct electricity because there aren't very many. It makes equal parts hydronium and hydroxide, so equal parts acid and base, and that's why water is neutral, because the amounts of acid and base are the same, so they offset each other. With the autolysis of water, we'll use brackets to represent the molarity, so that's just like when we started doing moles in Unit 6. We use those square brackets, and that represents the concentration or molarity. So the square brackets around the H3O plus is the molarity of the hydronium ion. When acids and bases are dissolved in water, the concentration of hydronium ion times the concentration of hydroxide ion are equal to Kw, which is 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. Kw is the equilibrium constant for that reaction that was on that slide that I just showed you for the autolysis of water. And if you look, that Kw is in your packet. So for those numbers to be equal to make 1 times 10 to the negative 14th, you think about what you know about exponents, and we will look at what those numbers would have to be. The concentrations would have to be 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molar and 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molar uh, hydronium and hydroxide to equal Kw because we know that when we add our, our two exponents that's what happens when we multiply two numbers. We add the negative 7 and the negative 7 and that gives us negative 14. So they're just really tiny amounts of the hydronium and hydroxide ion so that explains why water doesn't conduct electricity. We'll talk about this some more in class, and then we're going to look at acid-base reactions. I'll see you in class.